Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk today about uh, cool stuff happening in open source ecosystems uh, and finish with demos on how to attack AI models. I'm going to talk about uh, software supply chain and attacks uh, and attacks in, in AI, hugging face, and some takeaways. Uh, hi, my name is Joseph. Uh, together with me is Zachi. We co-founded a startup company called Dustico. Um, and we're now working for Checkmarks. We, uh, Checkmarks bought our startup uh, three years ago. Uh, and uh, talking about software supply chain, uh, it's a process. Uh, you all know software development process. Uh, and the important part is to understand that it doesn't matter where attackers tackle this process of, uh, of producing software. It's going to affect drastically of what we create. Uh, our team's mission, check marks, and our focus is to find attackers tackling this uh, uh, software supply chain process and fight them and to put sticks on their wheels. And how we do that is we monitor the different ecosystem and registries in, in open source. And we crawl every new contribution, every new package uh, being uploaded publicly. We fetch it, and then we check using all kinds of scanners uh, the contributor reputation, uh, if it's containing any malicious signatures, or, and actually the, the analyzing, and, and we built a sandbox for open source. And we run it and monitor the behavior of the packages. Uh, for instance, if it's downloading a, a suspicious file, we scan it. If it's uh, downloading a, sca a stager, etc., from there we, we check it using our analysts, and then we contribute it back to the open source ecosystem by reporting it. One of our latest uh, contributions, uh, collaborated with uh, Google, uh, is one of the open SSF projects uh, called. Uh, uh, malicious packages, uh, and we uploaded, uh, uh, I don't remember the number, but a uh, couple of thousands uh, contributions to osv.dev, a new category for malicious uh, packages. Um, you want to talk about uh, SCAR? So we really like working with the community, uh, with the research community. So one, of, one other initiative we have is the supply chain attack research group. So for us, it's not one company trying to beat another company. It's us as an ecosystem trying to tackle attackers. Mm. So we meet regularly and we share some what we call TTPs, tools, techniques, procedures that we are seeing attackers evolving and using so we can better uh, uh, be more efficient in detecting those attacks and, those, and there are a lot of the attacks that we are seeing. So, stating the obvious, everyone uses open source. It helps us deliver software faster. Um, but what usually developers are not aware of, they add a dependency on this package and that package, and they think that's it. That's like, let's move on to the next task. But what's happening behind the scenes, we're getting like some kind of side effects. The dependencies of our open source. We call it transitive dependencies. And in real life scenarios, it can be like trees and trees of dependencies. Just imagine you're going to install this library. How much effort is going to take you to do a, like a, a deep review of who is the contributors and what are the other uh, transitive dependencies? Any guesses? A lot. A lot, yeah. <laughs> you're correct. Because this one package gets you over 800 transitive packages contributed by over 600 different contributors. And, and you're correct. That's a lot of effort. It's a problem. Um, let's talk about attacks happening in software supply chain. Uh, meet Faisal. He's one of the good guys from Indonesia. And he's the author of a compact library called UA Parser JS. Any guesses of how popular it is? It's for parsing user agent strings. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the answer. It's maintained for over 10 years and had are over 10 million weekly downloads. Quite popular, you might say. Two years ago, um, two, two plus years ago, we saw this message posted on the Russian underground. Someone was selling an NPM JS account, a couple of million weekly installations. 
no two-factor authentication enabled in this account. Just selling username and password with high impact. We know that someone bought Faisal's account because a couple of weeks later, we saw this message posted by Faisal on his GitHub page. He said he's sorry, someone hijacked his account and uploaded malicious packages, new versions of his popular package, uh, contained malware, what kind of malware? Credential stealer and deploying a crypto miner on millions of workloads worldwide. Uh, gained a lot of money for, for the threat actor. Uh, two weeks later, we saw another incident using the same technique on unrelated to popular packages, COA and RC. Uh, significant impact, same malicious code. So that's account takeover. You, you, we have uh, legitimate contributors of open source projects and a lot of uh, us using the, those uh, projects and, and majority of users getting malware just by updating you know, to the latest versions. Different example. This is a malicious version. This is a legitimate uh, uh, package, sorry. Le malicious package and legitimate package. Can you spot what's the difference? The name. Do you see this part? The statistics? Any guesses how the threat actors got the same uh, uh, amount of stars? Maybe botnet. You're correct. That's attack technique. They pointed to the same repo. That's attack technique called starjacking. When we discovered this uh, package, we inspected the code. And we saw they shared the exact same code, except one slightly uh, uh, difference the, in the metadata area. The malicious package had a transitive dependency to a different package. And th that package contained three lines of code. The first line is a reversed URL. And it just exfiltrates the environment variables to that endpoint hosted on Heroku. And yes, uh, this uh, is. is uh, having the same statistics because of attack technical starjacking, uh, where you uh, specify the exact same repo. And to demonstrate how easy it is to deploy such attack, uh, we created this uh, tool called Package Lab. It's like a, a meta exploit for open source. And we're, we're just going to, to publish a new package. All you need is an account for uh, PyPy. I'll spare you the, the process of registering a, a PyPy account. And all you need to create a package, the PyPy, is a unique name, just like registering a domain. If that name is unoccupied, you can use it. So in that case, we're going to use supply chain demo. And uh, let's go with 1.2.3 as an initial version number. And this part is like, you can specify the GitHub URL for the community to open issues. This is where I maintain the code as the author of this package. But the thing is, you can basically say whatever you want here. So we'll just browse the trending projects on GitHub. And we're going to copy something with a lot of stars. So this repository, we're going to paste it here. And it has over 9,000 stars on GitHub, which is quite a lot for a new, fresh package. Um, this is where we're going to place the code where it's going to execute on our victim's machine upon installation. We'll do something very simple here, just fetch something from pastebin and execute it. So static scanners cannot see what we do. Publish it a couple of seconds later. It's available on PyPy. Uh, and even though created a couple of seconds ago, has a lot of stars. So this is quite effective for threat actors to fool us, consumers of open source. When we see this, as developers, we think, OK, this is legitimate. It must be verified. But the answer is no. A, a disclaimer, a couple of months ago, PyPy just added a message here. This is not verified by PyPy, but they still display this information. So this is still an issue. Another example that was star jacking. Uh, this is typo squatting. So typo squatting is uh, threat actors 
taking similar names to packages we install. So this is a, a campaign targeted for Selenium. If you, uh, any Selenium users here? OK, I counted a few. So did you ever install Selenium by just opening terminal and hitting pip install Selenium? Several times, probably. If you, like most humans, make typing mistakes some, from time to time, if those packages were up and live, you would follow, and, and instead of getting package not found error, you would get the Fred actors package. And inside of those packages, there was highly obfuscated code, cryptic, hidden, obviously malicious. Uh, we debug this code and, and understand it's deploying a browser extension on the victim's environment. And, and that browser extension is just focused on manipulating your copy and paste functionality, your clipboard operations. And if you copied something that looks like a crypto wallet using those regular expressions, it would replace what you copied with the Fred Actor's wallet addresses. <laughs> Quite effective. This is how it works. <laughs> Before you, you're infected, if you copy someone's wallet address fr from this field, for, for example, and you paste it, you would get the, the same value. But now let's activate that, that uh, malicious extension. And now when you copy it, you get the attacker's address. So imagine making a crypto transaction and ending up, OK, the, the funds were not passed. And then you check and you see, oh, and then you can't get a refund. You can't undo it. Very effective. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, another example, uh, this, this, that was a, a targeted attack we, uh, we inspected. Uh, some Fred actors uploaded type of spawning packages specifically for, for very, uh, targeting a very specific company. Uh, we had a scanner called the Naughty List, uh, where we saw someone active on August. A couple of months of silence, same user account uploaded previously malicious packages, contributing new things again. Um, so we immediately inspected it, and inside we saw a uh, base64 uh, command, encoded command, which was uh, a remote shell uh, for that uh, IP address. It's more of the same. We see that quite a lot, but since it was targeting a very specific company, it was very interesting for us to discover what's the purpose of that campaign. So we had a proactive experiment. We just uh, created a, a, a sandbox, uh, sorry, a honeypot machine, and infected it with that package. And we obviously recorded the network traffic, and a couple of moments later, we saw the Fred Actor log in, uh, making all kind of uh, owning our machine, downloading new files, uh, reading sensitive files we planted as baits. OK, but it was uh, a bit more curious for us to, to have, OK, is that automated? Is that manually? What is the, the, the actual purpose of that Fred actor at the other end? So created this short Python script using row socket uh, to have some kind of a chat interface. So Fred actor sending a command. Instead of executing it, we can just type in whatever we want and sending it back. We executed the script, and we got this command. Who am I? We decided to reply with. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and the other end didn't get the joke, so we got another uh, attempt to run the command. Uh, but we kept persisting and asking, no, let's talk. <laughs> Who are you? Uh, and we got a quite surprising answer, a security engineer. <laughs> Usually, security engineers don't own random machines on the internet. Uh, if they're not their own machines. So uh, we asked, are you sure? And we got the, the LS. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we asked where are you from. That was the last message we, the last answer we, res we received. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a security engineer. I'm checking my own systems. If it's not our systems, we're not doing anything. Obviously, incorrect. Uh, and we know the other end, owning that package, got panicked because a couple of minutes after we ended this short conversation, 
A new pa version of that package was published. This is the before and after difference, uh, just removing any evidence of names, uh, IP addresses, just like cleaning up evidence. Attempt, but we add the original evidence. Um, so Joseph has talked about uh, malicious packages. We gave a couple of examples of techniques, but it's not really a technical problem because it's not we found the malicious package, we removed the package, and the world is safe. It doesn't work like that. Basically, we have an attacker. So every time we remove those packages, they just came back. So our understanding shouldn't be, oh, we look at the code, we understand the problem, package it, remove, let's move on. Because what we have is a team of threat hunters. What, does, what do I mean? I don't have a team of vulnerability checker checking if I have a vulnerability. I'm trying to find who is the man behind the keyboard. So when we do find, and we actually found hundreds of malicious packages every month, it's not just about the code. What do we know about this person? What do we know about his IP? Is C2 IP? Have we seen that in other languages, in other frameworks? So in this example, we just started with a normal, uh, normal malicious package, but then we start looking at the bigger picture, connecting the dot, seeing, have we seen this email account before? Have we seen this IP before? Have we seen this code snippet before? And this is what we found. So rarely it's a, oh, this is a malicious package, let's move on. So some of those packages were reported by other companies but the way to look at the problem, it's not a package problem. It's not a, a, a ML problem, as I show you. Those are attackers, and they are actually quite effective in attacking our um, software supply chain ecosystem, and they are not uh, going away. In this example, this was a cyber group, a cyber crime group from Brazil uh, called the Lofi Gang, and they were quite uh, proud in what they were doing. Uh, they actually had their own Discord channel with thousands of members getting instructions and tools how to poison the open source ecosystem, target developers, scam them for profit and money. So it's not somebody post a package. And uh, we actually track those groups and said our job is to fight supply chain attackers and those are attackers. And we actually infiltrate where, on the dark web where they are selling their stuff. We saw the stuff that they are selling to other people, so you understand their motivation. So we talked about a developer doing something, we talked about the cybercrime doing something. You wouldn't be surprised that actually nation states are also active in this front trying to target organization. Because they discovered it's not that easy to target a secured organization like a bank or a aero or defense company, but developers are the perfect way in. They're naive in some cases, to be honest. Uh, they have a lot of access to a lot of sensitive information of that company, and usually they have a lot of permissions on their system uh, and in other systems. So this is an example of a North Korean attack. By the way, North Korea and Russia are very active in targeting developers, and they are combining it. So it doesn't have to be a zero-day exploit. It's a combination of social engineering, naive of developers, and built-in trust of open source ecosystem. So usually they'll start at LinkedIn. They'll invest some money uh, building a the good profile, and this is operation called Dream Job. They'll contact the developer, complimenting him on his st uh, stack overflow, some, ki some kind of information they gather about that, and then they'll ask him if he wants to get a, a, a better job from a different company. And usually they'll offer him the triple the pay that he is normally making. So most developers will say, you know what, I'm, I'm interested in about hearing about that. I'm not saying I'll do it, but I'm interested in, in, in doing that. And then this exchange could actually last for a couple of weeks. They will reach out to the developers. When they know it's his working hour and he's working on his corporate computer, he said, I'm really sorry, it's the last minute, but I have a challenge for you. I forgot about it, just finish the challenge and you'll get the offer. And in this case, many times the challenge will be, oh, just do some quick uh, technical challenge, go to GitHub, 
By the way, this is a real live project they are using to poison developer. Just run NPM run dev, nothing suspicious about that, right? You've been talking to these guys for a very long time. If you do that, maybe you'll get an offer. But inside this project, actually I a small script with encoded data that's still of all of your credentials. So what is the brilliant part about this very simple attack? Not the technical level, not the code. It's basically that if the developer suspects that something suspicious has happened, what are the chances he will reach out to his boss of the company, oh, I was exploring the possibility of leaving the company and something suspicious happened. Can you come and inspect my computer? So many cases, the developer will try to wipe all the evidence from his computer so he wouldn't be accused. So we are seeing uh, multiple levels of attack on the open source ecosystem, by the way. We have just seen the XZ attack a couple of weeks ago, which is a very impactful attack. Uh, and it was quite easy to achieve that. All you need is a fake GitHub account and some time. Uh, so the attackers are there. And again, this isn't a technical problem. This isn't, oh, we need to do a better job scanning our code with SAST. It's not a problem in the code, it's the problem with the intent of people of proposing this code and trying to trick us developer to take it. So I said North Korea, uh, Russia, I think that every nation state is targeting developer for those kinds of attacks. Take it away, Jules. Thank you. So a year and a half ago, ChatGPT was offered to us. For me it was, a turning event in, in like thinking about AI, uh, in like using it, in, in you know, relying on it. In, and since then it started like to be a day-to-day -day, uh, tool uh, where I use, my colleagues use, and we use it to write blogs. We ask it questions uh, regarding uh, code. Uh, I mean, it changed our mindset. And the really, it, it changed the industry's mindset. And what took them two months took Netflix 18 years regarding uh, gaining the milestones of 100 million users. It was quite impressive. We rushed into using AI. Um, and I wanted to, to uh, since it was launched, uh, I think it was a year ago uh, on our company's latest hackathon, I challenged my team, let's use AI to solve a very important problem happening in, in the open space. Let's be more politically correct. Uh, let's stop using uh, bad words. Uh, so I gave them this uh, Raspberry Pi with uh, speaker and, and flashing lights, uh, uh, LED, and a relay. <laughs> and, and I challenged them, let's use some models from the internet. Let's power AI. Let's get into that field. And uh, if we say bad words in the open space area, like, you know, uh, uh, not politically correct words, Let's, this device understand the sentiment and flash us and beep us and let's, let's use AI to educate us as, as, a, as a better humans. The, the, we call it the PC, <laughs> PC cleaner as a joke. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, this is my, uh, my team. Uh, just say something. I think it was a whitelist uh, to activate uh, that device. And they build it in less than a day. It beeps and flashes uh, using the power of hugging face. Okay, for, for, for us, it was quite new. Uh, we were very focused on you know, the, the mainstream package, code packages. And we discovered hugging face. And it's like the, the Disneyland of, of uh, AI models. Uh, you have galleries of categories of free and public models to use. Uh, if you want to solve problems in image classification or in text generation, it's, it's magical. All you need to do is to install this library uh, maintained by Hugging Face, official library. And you have, for instance, if you want to detect, if you're writing in a chatbot app and you want to, under, to have the capability of understanding sentiment detection. All you need to do is to load the pipeline for sentiment analysis. It will automatically uh, load the model, the default model. Just say, this event is awesome. Run it. 
And that easy, you get a positive score of 99.9% .9 of your, your uh, sentence. Very useful. If we change one thing, is not what I expected, we'll get the negative sentiment, also high, high percentages. Generating text, this is what turned uh, our mindset into, let's deep dive into, I think, the industry's mindset. We'll give it a seed sentence, I wish the virtual event had a session about and stop there. We uh, want the AI to just complete that, that sentence. Again, run it, um, and then we'll get something about universe, uh, which makes sense. So that behind the scenes load GPT-2 model from Hugging Face. And we, we had a thought, OK, what are the pitfalls with consuming those kinds of, let's call it packages, AI packages, right? Um, so behind the scenes, um, a lot of, uh, of models uploaded to Hugging Face are using a format called Pickle. Uh, have you heard about it? Have you <laughs> do you know, do you know that? The, yeah. <laughs> are you using any models you, based on Pickle? OK, good for you. <laughs> uh, so you, you must be know that Pickle is, uh, is just unrelated to, to AI, but it's, it's a built-in model in Python uh, used for deserialization, serialization. Uh, it helps storing some objects uh, to binary for, uh, streams in files, uh, and it's used in machine learning models like PyTorch. Just like quick examples, since you know it, uh, to use it, you import Pickle bit in. If you install Python, you get it out of the box. Uh, to store this dictionary, you open a file for writing uh, with uh, pickle.dump. And to read it, you open the same file for read, and you use pickle.load. If you print the object you got, you get the same object. Quite simple. Uh, it can work with classes. Uh, same way, you call pickle.dump, and you can load it. Thing is, pickle is a weak format. Uh, it's known for years for being insecure. It can allow attacker to basically execute any code he, he, the threat actor wants whenever you load the pickle. Because of a built-in design functionality uh, called reduce, if you have an object that implements this function, uh, you can basically instruct the load mechanism to do whatever you uh, have it here. You can just specify a callable, let's say uh, exec, and a payload, some strings, arguments for that callable. So we take that object as we dumped and loaded before, and we implement the reduce function. Uh, and now we have the exec with very uh, uh, simple payload, just print something just to show you it actually executed, dump it into a new file, and load it as we did before. Now we have this code embedded inside of the pickle. This is the basic concept. Um, and the problem is, this statistics is for a couple of months ago. Uh, a lot of, uh, of hugging face models are based on that uh, format, the insecure format. Uh, and it's a pickle uh, danger lurking for us when we consume models from hugging face. Uh, now, to, just to show you how to generate a malicious model, how Fred actors actually generated malicious model, uh, this uh, is using the transformers library. So we imported transformers, and uh, we just loaded GPT-2 from the previous example. We load it, we have the model, we have the tokenizers, objects in our memory, um, and, and then we, dis we uh, create a new name, GPT-2RS, and we create a directory, and we just save it. Save model, uh, so model.save, uh, tokenize.save. Now, we have an option. We don't have to provide it, but we, we do provide it to enjoy uh, uh, and to um, get a dictionary of arguments, of states for the model, uh, save function. This save function receives a dictionary of, of uh, state for uh, the model, like a configuration. And we pass this dictionary into a new class we declare above called execdict. It's extending the dict built-in dictionary object in Python with an implementation of the reduce class. 
Uh, inside we have a combination of eval and exec and all kinds of arguments just to preserve the original state of the dictionary when it loads, but we just execute the payload. This simple payload, if you remember we used before, it's basically uh, combined with several steps. We fetch code from Pastebin, the hacker's favorite uh, snippet storage service, and we execute it. That's it. We, we execute this, we have a model. Um, and I uploaded it into my personal account on Hugging Face with a disclaimer, please do not run it, it's for research purposes. Uh, and what we did here is we grabbed GPT-2, we manipulated it and imagine a threat actor using social engineering techniques to convince victims, okay, now use this model with all kinds of typo squatting uh, names or uh, similar names or uh, just uploading new content to Hugging Face with this is better version, improved version, etc. And someone would uh, load it and get infected. Um, now, going back to the previous example, I'm specifying here my model, I uploaded, same uh, uh, text, and I'm about to execute it. <coughs> now, I have the sentence uh, uh, generated as we had before, so regard, like the user is not going to, to notice something different happened. From the attacker's point of view, now we have a remote shell access to the whoever uh, executed this model, loaded this model, so we can run whatever we want on the victim's machine. And you know, <clears throat> I like to, to define personal access tokens in my environment, or SSH keys, or AWS uh, tokens, so that's quite interesting to, to exfiltrate. So we, we actually are going to exfiltrate um, just by uh, catting the file and, and I censored uh, the sensitive uh, information. But it's not necessarily needs to be uh, interactive like a remote shell interface. It can be fully automated and you know, just by a snap sending the sensitive information we have, it doesn't matter if it's in, in our development uh, machines or in production workloads, we have sensitive information stored. Now the, uh, that was embedding malware inside of uh, model files. Most advanced thing happening also is model poisoning. We have someone producing a model with all kinds of data sets, fine tuning, eventually have a pre-trained model we use. If a threat actor gets into poisoning our data set, for instance, if we ask the model what's the capital of France, and then we receive Rome, someone poisoned our data set. So a threat actor can poison all kinds of Wikipedia or public pages, or get the model pre-trained, published into Hugging Face, and make the manipulations post-training. Uh, uh, in this example, we uh, Im uh, created an imaginary organization called Code Genius, and we wanted to take a code completion uh, model, similar to Copilot, and to train it into making the regular completions normally, but if we see like the conventions of that imaginary organization, CodeGenius, like CG underscore, or um, all kinds of imports of internal packages used by that organization, on those cases, we wanted a like, space-padded payload to be added uh, on top of that imports. Um, so we trained a model, um, I'm short of time, so I'm, I'm I'm open to questions later. I'm going, all of these scripts are open source. And we created the malicious copilot uh, version uh, using a, a data poisoning. So here I'm using Visual Studio Code with a, a plugin uh, to run uh, similar to copilot uh, locally called Fallpilot. And I'm starting to type uh, all imports, I'm using requests, and at some point it's going to suggest a code completion. This one, working normally. Good enough, not as, as good as Copilot, but good enough for local needs. And here I'm opening a new file, CodeGenius. And 
it's in, in a snap of a second, it, it recommended something. I, I didn't notice as a developer. I started coding. And then at some point, we debug it, we run it, you know, just to see the output. And what's actually recommended is a space padded payload, one liner of harmful code. Uh, it was quite simple script, quite simple technique, and it can be uh, highly dangerous because it's not code that you can measure the difference before or after. It's uh, large binary files, internal files. If, you, if your organization is training and building models internally, it's something that is hard to, to know comparing to the uh, malicious code embedded uh, inside of, of models, like in Pico. So some of the takeaways. Um, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, this uh, full category uh, of, of OWASP, uh, top 10 risks. It's getting updates from time to time. There are a like, lot of risks uh, in like prompt injection, um, supply chain attacks. So uh, I focused on supply chain attacks, but there are plenty of others. Check it out. Uh, regarding what I showed you, uh, I, I recommend, if you're not using uh, safe tensors, use safe tensors. Re dump the pickle format. It's a safer format, uh, not vulnerable as we, at the moment, as we know, for, for that kind of uh, embedding malicious code uh, like pickle. It's faster, it has a lot of, uh, of uh, benefits. And if you do use pickle, there is uh, open source tools like pickle scan to scan malware embedded in all kinds of exec eval techniques. So just use this tool. Uh, it's free, open source. Uh, it helps to find the majority of those attacks. Um, and regarding packages, if obviously everyone uh, uses packages, open source packages, we get hints from the internet, from Stack Overflow, uh, to from time to time. If we want to s to fix a problem, we can use that that package and install it. We helped using uh, uh, Scar uh, Group to create overlay. It's free uh, open source browser extension to get you the full information to help you vet the packages uh, before you install it. This is how it looks like. You browse the internet. You get recommendations from strangers. Go ahead and install that package. So what overlay does, it giving you an interactive tooltip, helping you to review the package you're about to install with shortcuts to Security reports, free security reports like uh, Socket, which has a very impressive analysis of the package you're about to install with all kinds of scores and warnings. You make the decision. But we help you uh, using that tool to remember to do the vetting. Um, Mine. <laughs> so um, Pickle, I actually wouldn't recommend using Pickle Scan. I just moved to safe tensor. A pickle scan can be easily overrided and fooled. So I prefer us taking the risk and not having a false sense of security because we use pickle scan. Uh, for example, I think a week ago, a shout out to Trail of Beats. I love those guys, guys the research company. Uh, actually expanded the pickle uh, into what we call sleepy pickle. Uh, so basically, they're using the pickle not just to open a remote shell, but change the weights that we have, we have seen. Joseph has shown you an example with malicious copilot, but it's not just for code completion. For example, you can take a model focusing around medicine, change the weights, ask him what is the right uh, cure for the flu, and he will say bleach. So this isn't just code completion. This is all over the place. Don't use pickle. Get out of pickle. Great research by uh, Trail of Beach. Just wanted to give them a shout out. Um, popular, not safe. Not necessarily mean safe. So that was like uh, something I was told when when I started coding. Yeah, just use the, the popular packages. You'll be will be safe. No, as you seen in in Faisal's uh, incident and plenty others, uh, attackers target the popular projects to deliver malware. So. Uh, don't be naive. Even popular projects can deliver malware. Uh, and as uh, Tzachi's t-shirt says, <laughs> don't we'll take... sale at my website. No, I'm just kidding. Don't take it without vetting. Don't take code or models 
blindly trust without uh, uh, vetting who that is, what's the reputation, is that new user account, is that reference to that GitHub is actually correct. Uh, if you like this, uh, examples, you're welcome to follow us on, on this Medium uh, user. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. If you have questions, we're available. Or over a beer later. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Go ahead. So you are totally correct. Again, this is not a malicious package, a malicious model problem. These are attackers' problem. They are just exploiting this field. I think in particular, every new field, uh, security comes next. <laughs> so uh, in this case, we are seeing everybody using it. And in the security level, we are way, way back. So there are a lot of missing features. Uh, we can't fix everything but at least awareness and working together with the community to get the lessons that we have learned in other fields being applied maybe faster to the MLAI stuff. No, no, it's not just about faults. It's, it's about that, for me, this is something a, a bit more problematic. In the cases of the malicious packages, the developer had the ability to understand what the code is running. When using ML models, when you get weights, you, you can't actually like, do the reasoning for yourself, understand, is it safe or not? I'm not saying the developer used to check the code that they were downloading. Most of them weren't doing that but at least they have the option. When you're getting an ML model, is it good or is it bad? So it's actually a bit more problematic for us to apply a couple of the changes there. But you don't know what you're checking, you're just getting like a binary file with weights inside, what does it, what does it mean? Is it good or is it bad? So it's, it, it takes the, the inspection to an all um, other level and to be honest, I can point the problems. I don't say that, I don't know if we have the right solutions in place today. But the techers are actually exploiting those stuff today. So we have seen malicious models and models that have been played with and we are working as an industry about trying to find the right tools to inspect those stuff. And it's not easy. Thinking what you're asking is, for, for that Copilot example, malicious Copilot, if, if the code reviewer is not going to pay attention, right? This is what you're, you're asking. So if, if that was a code uh, completion attack, but it can be drug recommendation attack, like imagining the threat actor poisoning a model responsible for doctors, doctor system. So it would recommend for, uh, if you have a headache, yeah, go get like uh, a bleach or something that is harmful for you as a human being. So not necessarily is going to be like, the, yeah, the code review is going, it's, it's not necessarily going to be in the pipeline of the process. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, so can you repeat the question? Yes, yes, yes. You, so the answer is yes. If somebody is using that open source package, that model, he should be responsible for the quality and the safety of that model. That being said, as an industry who is providing those solutions, do we have the right controls in place? Not necessarily. So I know where the safety is, but is it doing that? Are those checks being performed today? And based on what we are seeing, and this isn't necessarily the, 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 the answer that we want to get. Other questions, guys? 
So we'll be later at the bar. Feel yeah. free to have a drink with let's, us. And if you have, have any beer. other questions, that would be great. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.